Welcome to another edition of Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm Shelley Shepard, Information and Education Program Manager for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And today on Arizona Wildlife Views, we travel to South Dakota to collect some very special bison that we're bringing back to the Grand Canyon State. We'll meet an artist who gets his inspiration by exploring the outdoors. And finally, we'll teach you how to cast a fly rod in the first of our four-part series on fly fishing. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Here at Raymond Wildlife Area, southeast of Flagstaff, Arizona Game and Fish is taking part in a national effort to conserve and protect these very special bison. As you're about to see, we brought them here all the way from South Dakota. <laughs> In 2017, the Arizona Game and Fish Department made some big moves for bison conservation. It started really as sort of a hallway conversation a few years ago. A few of us were sitting around talking about the, the story of the near extirpation and recovery of bison. And that as wildlife managers, wouldn't it be neat and should we work together at a national, regional, and statewide level to further bison conservation, the former icon of American wildlife. And our answer to each other was yes. That led them to Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota. It's home to a herd of bison that are direct descendants of some of the last American bison to survive into the 20th century. North America was once home to millions of bison, but unregulated market hunting nearly wiped them out, and by the 1880s only several hundred animals remained. The wind cave bison are the result of an early effort to conserve this iconic species. The origin of the founder herd was actually 14 animals from the Bronx Zoo in New York City, and then six from the Yellowstone herd. You know, we got animals from over 100 years ago from the Bronx Zoo where Teddy Roosevelt and some of the early conservationists grabbed up the remaining bison left out on the prairie and started a herd there. So we started with a really robust genetic herd and we've been able to maintain that now for over 100 years. Cattle genes are common in American bison herds, but so far cattle genes have not been detected in the wind cave lineage. So the wind cave genetics are um, pretty unique. We have 10 unique alleles within our herd which makes our herd very genetically diverse. And the only herd comparable to us is that of Yellowstone. Wind Cave National Park's grasslands can only support about 500 bison. So every two years, the park gives away excess animals. Thank to, you for all being here. To conservation groups interested in starting a satellite herd. We're gonna rotate through every age, sex of animal and who gets it. Maybe the first yearling goes to Arizona yearling male, then the second one goes to Kankakee Sands, and the third one goes to Smoky Valley. So this is gonna be a large operation. It's gonna take multiple days. These are not costing Arizona Game and Fish one penny. Uh, well, other than, than uh, the, the fuel it took us to get up here and, uh, and a, a semi truck coming back. So it's, it's a pretty good deal. It was a deal Game and Fish couldn't pass up. So in October of 2017, the agency sent a team of biologists to South Dakota to help sort and process bison. Yeah, so really what this whole setup is about is um, trying to get a herd of bison into a nice orderly single file line. And then finally get them into that, that last um, compartment you see into that blue squeeze chute. And that's really where the, the rubber meets the road at that point. Um, because the sides fold down on that, the gate's gonna drop down and kind of hold the head. And so that's when the biologists can get in there. So we have a one and a half year old female. 
They can draw blood to test for disease, attach an ear tag, and microchip the animal if it hasn't been chipped before. Okay, everybody's good. Open it up. Open it up. This one's got a little nick on her hip, too. Uh, dry female, 118. Each bison destined for Arizona is checked out by Game and Fish veterinarian Ann Justice Allen. So my main responsibility at this point is to kind of check the animals over and see if there's any really significant injuries or um, signs of disease. Yep, right there. And then we're giving them two sets of vaccinations and also some dewormers so that if they have any intestinal parasites that they don't bring those intestinal parasites to Arizona. All righty. Arizona pin two. At the end of the process, the bison are directed into various holding pens. Arizona, game and fish. These are Arizona's animals. The plan is to transport as many as 60 bison back to Arizona. It's pretty special, pretty, pretty unique and pretty amazing opportunity. Arizona Game and Fish is the first state wildlife agency to start a satellite herd of wind cave bison. We know we can only grow our herd to about 350 to 500 here, but the geneticists will say, well, if you want to retain that genetic diversity over 100 years, 200 years, you need to get up close to 1,000 animals. Since 1987, nearly 2,000 animals have been exported to various Indian tribes, conservation groups, and government agencies interested in managing a satellite herd of wind cave bison. It helps the park keep its bison population in check while preserving its precious genetics. Fifty-five bison, all yearlings and two-year-olds, are loaded into a cattle truck for the thousand-mile drive to Arizona. The bison are unloaded at Raymond Wildlife Area, about 35 miles southeast of Flagstaff. The property is owned and managed by Game and Fish. It had been home to a small herd of bison that was removed to make room for the wind cave lineage. As the bison were getting used to their new home, another translocation took place in December. We'll just um, open up the gate and let them run into here. After a long overnight journey, 15 bison leap out of a cattle trailer and into unfamiliar territory. They were given to Game and Fish by the American Prairie Reserve in Montana. House Rock Wildlife Area once again has, has bison. It, it feels good, you know, we, we've, we've always had bison here. Uh, they just don't make it down into this country very often. With these bison, Game and Fish is trying to reestablish a herd at House Rock Wildlife Area. It's a game and fish property located just north of the Grand Canyon. Bison that lived here for decades eventually moved onto the Kaibab Plateau and into Grand Canyon National Park, where there's no hunting to manage the population. As a result, they're doing serious damage to the park's natural and cultural resources. Meanwhile, wildlife managers hope they can condition these new bison to remain on the House Rock property. It gives us the opportunity to reset breeding grounds and, and calving grounds back on House Rock where we have more control of the, of the herd. It's one of the few spots in Arizona that we can, we can have them in here, yeah. Here in, in Raymond Wildlife Area, both of these herds will contribute on a national level to bison conservation. Back at Raymond Wildlife Area, the Wind Cave Bison seem right at home. They're actually mellow as can be. They're, they're doing their own thing. They're still getting used to the feed that's here. They're used to prairie grass up in North, uh, South Dakota, and uh, the, the grass here is quite different. We will invite people to come out here and view them. We have a wonderful visitor center here. Whether you choose to enjoy them by knowing they're there, whether you choose to enjoy them by viewing them with your family, or whether you choose to hunt them. There is value, I would argue, for almost anybody in Arizona to share in our belief that this is a success story for conservation.
My name is Trevor Swanson. I'm a wildlife artist here in Phoenix, Arizona. What you get with a, an oil painting is a, a real depth and a richness of the colors. For me, the pieces that really come together and really have life are when I've been there, I've seen it. All my paintings start somewhere in the field, somewhere out there. What things look like actually, the, the habitat is as important as animals and your subject to what you're gonna put in there. Man, that's some cool color though, holy cow. I came up here mainly to study some lichen. The feel of the lichen, how rough it is, how soft it is to the eye, but how rough it is actually under your fingers. All those things kind of make their way into a painting. It's the details and I'm known for my, my detail. This has been on my list to get to this little point of rocks right here for a couple years. And just something about it, it's just, it brings a smile to your face just to be out. So you finally accomplished it, got up next to the lichen. Perfect. I love the outdoors. I'm growing up hunting, growing up hiking. Every day spent outside is, there's something. You know, you come away with something special. I imagine myself to have like a, a creative battery that to go out here and be in, be in the wilds, getting the fresh air, is, that's where I go to, to recharge that battery. It's something that it just gets in your blood. It's like, yeah, I realize what kind of beauty there is out there. With nature work, you know, doing landscapes, doing animals, it's pretty straightforward. It's something that's easier to, to really tell a story effectively because it, it's almost done a lot of the work for you. Here's this beautiful, cool, interesting thing. All I have to do is just put it up out there on canvas and share it with people. Already right here, I can see exactly this, what I was looking at this morning is mainly the, the color and the texture. That's exactly what I wanted to do on, the, on these rocks. I've got a, a bobcat that I'm working on with some of the, our, our desert scenery. For some reason, the last couple of years, I've had a lot of good contact with, with bobcats. So it's been a, a nice opportunity to, to study them a little bit. So what I've got is this guy that was kind of creeping out from between some rocks, just kind of gently taking his time. This is kind of the whole setting that I wanted to, wanted to capture him because he was up against this light, this beautiful kind of sunset in the background. This is what's most important. And then from here, I want your eye then to go around and see, see the rest of the piece. And what you can see when you look around the studios, I've got paintings kind of strewn about me in different stages of progress. I've got the pheasant was from South Dakota, a couple different things, the hummingbirds over here are from New Mexico, and then the wolves that I'm working on are from over up in British Columbia. Something I was, I was born into. This is, I come from a fam family of artists. I always enjoy doing a quail painting. I grew up in Prescott and have a, a history of hunting, chasing, and studying quail. They're beautiful birds, they've got such great color. Some critters, it's hard to kind of give any kind of emotion or mood, mood to them. But a quail is a lot of fun because the way that they hold their tails, the way they hold their top knot. The best thing for me is the biggest compliment is somebody looks at a piece of work and feels like they're there or they've been there. At that point, what I've done is I've told this story so completely that they feel like they're part of that painting. In the first part of our four-part series on fly fishing, we learn the art of the cast. Hi, I'm Cinda Howard with Fly Fish Arizona and Beyond. I'm a guide and a fly casting instructor. And we're here today to teach you a basic cast on how to cast a fly rod. First, I'm going to start with how do I hold a fly rod? And your fly rod has this cork handle, and in that handle is a little low spot. That low spot is made for the meaty part of your thumb just to rest there, and then my thumb just goes on top. Our goal is to move this rod in a straight line so the line goes out straight. So I want to move my arm in a straight line path. You know, you could visualize that as the rod tip moving across an imaginary ceiling and never touching the walls. We just need to pivot at the elbow 
and just lift our arm. And I want to stop about my ear. This is much like answering a telephone. Not much wrist movement at all. Most of your cast is just with that, that elbow. And you don't want to reach. You want to keep that rod nice and low, hand about the ear, so that you're able to move that rod tip in that straight line to get that line to go out straight and turn over. Other things that are happening is I'm making a crisp stop on the back and the forward cast. That stop transfers the energy from the rod to the line. So I stop here and here. The last thing I'm doing is I'm letting the line straighten out behind me. And when it does, the rod bends. And if I can make this rod bend, I can make a cast. The majority of the technology in your fly rod comes in the bend. So I let the line straighten out behind me before I come forward. If you're getting a lot of knots and tangles while you're casting, most of the time it's because you're a little too fast, like so, and that line never straightens out and it just creates a big bird's nest. So the goal is everything straightens out and then we come forward. So what we are trying to accomplish is we're trying to cast this line in what we call a tight loop. And the loop means it's the shape of the fly line in the air. I want the top and bottom part of that line to be close together. And that's what straightens out and delivers that fly to the water. You only want about this much space between your wrist and your, arm and your rod. If you have more than that, then you're going to be casting with your wrist and there's going to be way too much arc. We just had a little breeze that started blowing straight at us and I want to show you what happens if I move the rod tip straight and I get that nice tight loop that we had described and what happens in this wind with an arc. So first I'm going to throw a tight loop where I'm going to cast straight into this wind and you can notice that everything straightens out and goes forward. Now if I cast with that arc, which means I add too much wrist in this wind, this line just blows right back at me and doesn't have any energy, doesn't have any power. It doesn't want to go anywhere. So that's the importance of making sure that that rod tip moves straight and that line goes out straight and we have a tight loop versus having that arc that just blows around in the wind. So when I'm fishing this, I just strip the line in through my hand and then I cast it back out and let line slide on the forward cast only. The rest of the time I'm holding the line tight with my line hand and then I'm just letting it slide out on the forward cast. So when we make this cast, the rod tip's moving straight, I'm making a nice tight loop, arm not wrist, make that final stop, follow it to the water, and that's pretty much a basic cast on how to cast a fly rod. An arboretum is defined as a living collection of trees. So you might think an Arizona arboretum would have to be found in the northern part of the state, right? Well, not necessarily. The Boyce Thompson Arboretum, smack dab in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, is the largest and oldest botanical garden in Arizona. It was founded in 1924 as a desert plant research facility and living museum. It sits on nearly 400 acres just off U.S. Highway 60, three miles west of the town of Superior. The Arboretum has over 2,600 species of arid land plants and over 300 species of mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. From saguaros to agaves, aloes, and other succulents, the Arboretum has over 800 varieties of cactus. Boyce Thompson Arboretum is a riparian zone that attracts all sorts of desert wildlife and migratory birds. In fact, the Audubon Society has designated the Arboretum an important bird area. Whatever the season you choose to visit, you can explore tree-lined and flowered trails. There are a number to choose from, and it's a good place to do some easy to moderate hiking. Feeling trapped? Crushed? Is city life bringing you down? 
Sometimes you just have to get out. One way to get out and enjoy the beauty that Arizona has to offer is to go wildlife watching. Wildlife watching opportunities are everywhere. You can start close to home. Setting out and maintaining a hummingbird feeder is an easy way to get started. It's a fun and inexpensive activity for the entire family to enjoy together. You'd be surprised to see what you can find in your own backyard. A good place to find out about wildlife watching is on the Arizona Game and Fish Department website. Here you can discover unique areas around the state for wildlife viewing. You can also learn about upcoming watchable wildlife events, like bighorn sheep viewing workshops along our waterways and lakes. There are also workshops for viewing bison and elk. There are special photography workshops. And you can even find nighttime bat netting events. Now you won't want to miss all the wildlife events happening across the state, like the High Country Hummers Festival. There's wings over Wilcox. The Verde Valley Nature and Birding Festival. And many more. You can find them on the website as well. These festivals often have tours you can sign up for and enjoy a guided walk to see some amazing and beautiful animals. If you can't get away as much as you'd like, we've got you covered there too. The Arizona Game and Fish website hosts several webcams so you can enjoy wildlife watching from the comfort of your own home. The Sandhill Crane Cam is very popular when they arrive for the season. And you can check in on the protected puffish we have in a pond in Mesa. New webcams always seem to be getting installed, so check back often. The place to get started is online at www.azgfd.gov slash wildlife watching. Arizona is a great place to get outdoors, and we at Arizona Game and Fish intend to keep it that way by continuing to conserve and protect more than 800 species of wildlife. I'm Shelley Shepard. I hope you can get out here to enjoy these Arizona wildlife views. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, call 1-800-777-0015 or visit www.azgfd.gov magazine.